Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome and thank you for coming along. Uh, today we publish the first in a series of papers building a new Scotland. These will make afresh the case for Scotland becoming an independent country. An independent country better able to chart our own course here at home and as the outward looking nation we have always been play our part in building a stronger, safer, better world. Today, Scotland, like countries across the world, faces significant challenges. But we also have huge advantages and immense potential. The refreshed case for independence is about how we equip ourselves to navigate the challenges and fulfil that potential, now and in future. In their day-to-day -day lives, people across Scotland are, of course, suffering the impacts of the soaring cost of living, low growth and increasing inequality, constrained public finances and the many, many implications of a Brexit that we did not vote for. These problems have all been made worse, or most obviously, in the case of Brexit, directly caused by the fact we are not independent. So at this critical juncture, we face a fundamental question. Do we stay tied to a UK economic model that consigns us to relatively poor economic and social outcomes which are likely to get worse, not better, outside the European Union? Or do we instead lift our eyes with hope and optimism and take inspiration from comparable countries across Europe? Comparable neighbouring countries with different characteristics, countries that in many cases lack the abundance of resources that Scotland is blessed with. But all of them, independent and as we show today, wealthier and fairer than the UK. Today's paper and those that will follow in the weeks and months to come is about substance. That is what really matters. The strength of the substantive case will determine the decision people reach when the choice is offered, as it will be. And it is time now to set out and debate that case. After everything that has happened, Brexit, Covid, Boris Johnson, it is time to set out a different and better vision. It is time to talk about making Scotland wealthier and fairer. It is time to talk about independence and then to make the choice. Now, how we secure that choice, as we are committed to doing, is of course a highly pertinent question. So while today is very much about substance, let me address briefly the issue of process. I was re-elected as First Minister just over one year ago on a clear commitment to give the people of Scotland the choice of becoming an independent country. And the people of Scotland elected a Scottish Parliament with a decisive majority in favour of both independence and the right to choose. The Scottish Parliament, therefore, has an indisputable democratic mandate and we intend to honour that. A referendum, though, if it is to be deliverable, command confidence and achieve its objective must be lawful. It is the parties opposed to independence and only them who would benefit from doubt about the process. These parties don't want to engage on the substance of this debate because they know how increasingly threadbare their arguments are. Their only hope is to cast doubt on the process. Those of us who relish the opportunity to make and win the substantive case for independence mustn't allow them to do so. Of course, if this UK government had any respect at all for democracy, the issue of legality would be put beyond doubt, as in 2014, through a Section 30 order. I make clear to the Prime Minister again today that I stand ready to discuss the terms of such an order at any time. But my duty, as a democratically elected First Minister, is to the people of Scotland. It is not to Boris Johnson or to any Tory Prime Minister. This is a UK government that has no respect for democracy. 
And as we saw again yesterday, it has no regard for the rule of law either. That means if we are to uphold democracy here in Scotland, we must forge a way forward, if necessary, without a Section 30 order. For the reasons I've set out already, however, we must do so in a lawful manner. We know that in these circumstances, the competence of the Scottish Parliament to legislate is contested, and that, therefore, is the situation we must navigate to give people the choice of independence. Now, that work is well underway, and while I do not intend to go further into the detail today, I can say that I do plan to give a significant update to Parliament very soon indeed. The principles of democracy and the rule of law are fundamental. They should unite all of us, regardless of our politics. Indeed, democracy within the rule of law is how differences of political or constitutional opinion should always be resolved. The fact that these principles are now so deeply disrespected and disregarded day and daily in the UK is itself an indication of how broken Westminster governance is. Indeed, that has become part of the argument for independence. And it is to that substantive case that I now return. The choice people arrive at on independence must be an informed one. The case we make must speak not just to those who already support independence, but also, indeed, even more so to those not yet persuaded. It is an obvious point, but one that I think always bears repetition. Scotland will only become independent when a majority of those who live here vote for it. It is in that spirit, therefore, that we publish this first in the Building a New Scotland series of papers. Today, we set the scene. I can confirm, though, that papers to come later in the series and which are already in preparation will include the issues of currency, Scotland's fiscal position and how, with independence, we can build a more sustainable economy and, therefore, stronger public finances. Pensions and social security, EU membership and trade, defence and security. In these papers, we will set out how Scotland can benefit from the opportunities, the massive opportunities that independence will present. We will also confront openly the challenges. We will not shy away from tough questions. We will address key issues relating to the transition from a yes vote to independence and the infrastructure that will be required for the governance of an independent country. Of course, on that latter point, Scotland has already come a long way since 2014. A great deal of nation building has been done in the years since. For example, Scotland now has our own tax and social security agencies, an independent fiscal commission and a national investment bank. In other words, substantial parts of the infrastructure that an independent Scotland will need and which did not exist in 2014 are now in place. That means Scotland today is even more prepared for independence than we were in 2014. Of course, any case for change starts with an analysis of the status quo, and that is the purpose of the paper we are publishing today. It really isn't difficult to list the many ways in which Westminster governance is currently failing Scotland and holding us back. We have a Prime Minister with no democratic authority in Scotland and no moral authority anywhere in the UK. Brexit has ripped us out of the EU and the single market against our will with massive damage to trade, living standards and public services. Thanks to Brexit, the cost of living crisis is worse here in the UK than in any other G7 country. Inflation in the UK is double that of France. UK growth is now projected by the OECD to be the second lowest in the G20 next year. Only sanctioned Russia will be worse. The end of freedom of movement has left our businesses and public services struggling for workers. It has also robbed young people of opportunity. And to compound all of that, we face the very real risk now of an EU trade war due to the UK government's threat to breach international law over the Northern Ireland Protocol. That this is the very same UK government that negotiated and signed the protocol, a protocol that is actually delivering significant economic benefits to Northern Ireland, 
only adds to the absurdity. In short, the case for Scotland charting our own course, a better course, is strong and compelling. But the evidence we set out today shows that this case does not just rest on recent or temporary developments. In today's paper, we look in detail at 10 comparator countries, Ireland, Switzerland, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Iceland, Sweden, Austria, Belgium and Finland. The evidence is overwhelming that these countries, now and over time, perform better than the UK. Compared to these countries, many of them smaller or similarly sized to us, Scotland, under Westminster control, is being held back. With independence, we too would have the levers and the autonomy that these countries take for granted to help fulfil their potential. And let's look at the evidence presented today. Every single one of these comparator countries is wealthier than the UK. And that wealth gap has been maintained over the long term. All of these countries have greater income equality than the UK. Poverty rates are lower in every single one of them, with fewer children living in poverty. Most of them have a smaller gender pay gap. All of them have higher social mobility and they have more productive and innovative economies too. All of them have higher productivity. Most of them spend more on research and development. Business investment is higher too. The evidence set out in this paper is clear and it is unambiguous. All of these countries, all of them, are wealthier, fairer and more productive than the UK. And all of these countries, all of them, are independent. So as we look to the future, the great question before us is this. If all of these countries can and do use the powers of independence to create wealthier and fairer societies, why not Scotland? With our vast energy resources, why not Scotland? With our globally recognised record of in innovation, invention and learning, why not Scotland? With our exceptional food and drink industry, extraordinary natural heritage and the strength we have in advanced engineering and a range of cutting edge industries of the future, why not Scotland? Above all, with the talent and the potential of all of the people who live here, why not Scotland? Now, independence does not guarantee success for any country and we should never <coughs> pretend that it does. But for Scotland, independence will put the levers that determine success into our own hands. It will mean we can work in partnership with our friends in the rest of the UK, but not be subject to decisions of Westminster governments we don't vote for and which are taking us in the wrong direction. It will give us the ability, just like these comparator countries, to fulfil the vast potential we have and build the wealthier, fairer, happier country we know is possible. That then is the prize building a better nation now and for the future. That indeed is the whole purpose of independence. Grasping that prize will not be without challenge. Nothing worth doing ever is. So in the months ahead, we will set out in detail how we can make the transition to independence, how we can navigate and overcome these challenges so that this precious prize, the opportunity of a better country, can be won. Scotland, now and for the generations that come after us, deserves the very best and independence is how we can secure that. So thank you very much for listening. I will now hand over to Patrick to say a few words before both of us take your questions. Patrick. Thank you, First Minister. <coughs> and last year, of course, we were elected on manifesto commitments to deliver an independence referendum within this parliamentary term. We promised to lay the groundwork for an independent nation that's progressive, compassionate and built on the principles of democracy, equality and respect for the planet. So it's a real privilege to be here with you today alongside the First Minister and as part of the Scottish Government to set out how we intend to deliver on that commitment. Our world is changing. Economic inequalities are widening. People across Scotland are 
under ever more intense pressure as inflation grows and we're accelerating toward climate and environmental breakdown. Now with the limited levers and the finite budget that the Scottish Government currently has available, we're already doing what we can to navigate these stormy waters and deliver our vision of a fairer and greener Scotland. Just to give a few examples, the Scottish Child Payment is putting money into the pockets of those who need it most with free bus travel for young people and record investment in energy efficiency targeted at lower income households. We're cutting the cost of living and helping to tackle the climate crisis. These actions and much more show our determination to deliver on our promises. But we also have to be honest about the precarious situation that Scotland is in for as long as Westminster is making decisions over us. Countries the world over are facing economic turmoil and the challenges in transitioning to net zero, but we're forced to do so with our hands tied by the limits of the devolution settlement and held back by a hostile UK government. With the powers of a normal, independent European country, we could chart a different future. So the paper that we published today illustrates this basic but powerful point. It shows that we are being held back environmentally, socially and economically by successive Westminster governments that Scotland didn't vote for. And we all suffer the consequences, either directly or indirectly, as the Scottish Government is forced to spend limited devolved resources to tackle the income inequality that's being created by UK policies while other European countries succeed by building more equal societies in the first place. The simple fact is that hanging on to the Etonian coattails of the UK government in the hope that one day they might start making the right decisions for the people of Scotland has not worked, nor will it ever work. Just look at their response to the cost of living crisis, a crisis that is global in reach, but has been turbocharged by a hard Brexit. The inflation that we're struggling with, driven up by the damage wrought by Brexit. And the Westminster response, compared to other European countries, has been inadequate and extracted only after months of pressure and largely because of the Prime Minister's desperation to distract attention from the pile of fixed penalty notices in the Downing Street inbox. Independence would mean that the decisions that affect Scotland would be made here in Scotland. It means a Scottish Government and Parliament chosen by the people of Scotland for the people of Scotland being fully empowered to rise to the challenges that we now face, just like any other normal European country. And like the comparable countries that we've set out in this first paper, with the powers of independence we can build a prosperous, equal and greener Scotland. We can create a fair, fairer society where people are not forced into poverty. And by working with our European neighbours, we can play a powerful part in tackling the climate emergency, creating a net zero economy based on clean industries, both restoring nature and creating high quality, lasting green jobs. So these Building a New Scotland papers will set out what we could do with independence. They'll establish a blueprint for those early years for our new nation, a fairer nation and a greener nation that can rise to the challenges that we face. They won't be the only vision for the future. We want everyone to have a say in what an independent Scotland looks like. That's the very definition of independence after all, empowering the people of Scotland to choose our own future. So whether you voted yes or no in 2014, or if you're one of the half million young people who didn't get the vote last time but are now of voting age. Or indeed, if you're one of the many people who've since moved to Scotland and made this country your home, I hope that you'll join us over the coming months and play your part in making this an optimistic, constructive and inspiring debate about our potential, our future and the country we want to be. Thanks very much, Patrick. I'm going to move to questions now. I should say at the outset, time is not completely unlimited, but I do intend to get through as many questions as possible today. I can't promise we will get to absolutely everybody, but I, I will get round the room um, as uh, effectively as I can. Uh, I'll start with Glenn Campbell. Thank you, Patrick. Um, 
Dependence to try and grow the economy, or are you and your green colleagues still against economic growth? Um, I, I'll briefly uh, take that first of all. You know, the last six years have been probably the most tumultuous the country, as Scotland, the UK, the world has lived through, not least a, a global pandemic that has now persisted for uh, more than two years. Although, thankfully, uh, I hope uh, we are now on the other uh, side of the acute phase of that. So circumstances uh, over the past six years uh, have changed and have been difficult. Um, I firmly uh, believe we will have an independence uh, referendum. I believe people will have that choice. I am setting out today uh, the first in uh, what will be um, a very substantial argument for independence and, and very substantial exposition uh, of how you make the journey from a majority of people uh, opting for that and becoming uh, independent. I have uh, indicated the issues uh, that we are navigating, and I'm you know, being candid about the issues we are navigating in order to secure that process when we are up against a UK government that has no respect whatsoever for democracy. Um, but I am intent on navigating a way through that, and as I said, I will set out more uh, on that in the very near future. Um, I'll hand over to Patrick now. All I would say in the generality here is, um, and I, I hope I'm not saying anything too controversial right now, an independent Scotland will not be a one-party uh, state, um, whether I uh, like it uh, or not. And I should say I do like the fact that it will not be a one-party state. An independent Scotland will be a democracy, uh, and people will put forward different uh, policies, different views, uh, different approaches to the governance of Scotland in elections in an independent country. That is the, the essence of democracy. So the fact Patrick and I, uh, while we agree on many, many things and have a, a partnership agreement uh, right now underpinning the Scottish Government, the fact that we disagree on some things it actually makes the case uh, for vibrant democracy in Scotland. It does not in any way detract from that case. Patrick. Yeah, I think uh, one of the ways in which Scotland is already like normal European countries uh, is that you have political parties willing to sit down, acknowledge their differences, talk about how to resolve those differences, uh, and work together on the common ground. Uh, the issue of economic growth is excluded from the, the cooperation agreement that we have between the Greens and the, and the Scottish Government. That's because Greens around the world challenge the idea that everlasting economic growth is sustainable or that it measures people's well-being. But Scotland's already taking really significant steps toward creating and defining what a well-being economy looks like. And I've got no doubt that that will, that will continue. I think the point about this paper is, though, the evidence in here shows that whichever part of the political spectrum you're on, whatever your economic priorities, the status quo isn't working. It isn't working in terms of productivity or GDP. It isn't working in terms of social equity and fairness and it's not working environmentally either. Okay, uh, Colin Mackay. You said that you've contacted the Prime Minister today. Is that in writing? Uh, no, I've, I said I was making it clear to the Prime Minister today. I, I, I don't know whether he'll be watching or not, but if he is, I make it clear again, uh, Prime Minister. I stand ready to negotiate a Section 30 order uh, if you decide uh, that you now are a Democrat. I have to say the evidence of that up to date is not promising, uh, but I'll set out what we do in those uh, circumstances if he continues to deny democracy uh, very soon. So you haven't yet asked for the Section 30 order officially, but two Prime Ministers now, <laughs> Boris Johnson, Theresa May before him, have rejected that. What's going to change there? Well, I I've set out today what's going to change is I will set out a lawful way forward uh, without a Section 30 is if that is what is required. Uh, the other thing that I think is pertinent here is that we have a UK government and certainly on this issue this applied to Theresa May but on this and many other issues this certainly applies to Boris Johnson, a UK government that does not respect democracy and, and does not respect the rule of law. We saw that very powerfully uh, as recently as yesterday. And ultimately, while I think it would be better for the people of Scotland and the people of the UK if we had two governments able to sit down on that democratic basis and agree that we disagree on the uh, substance of independence but agree the process by which the people of Scotland would decide that would be far better. But I do believe that the problem of having a democracy denying 
uh, UK government and Prime Minister ultimately is their problem much more than it is mine because it actually becomes one of the powerful arguments for Scotland becoming an independent country where democracy and the rule of law uh, are against the fundamental principles that underpin everything that we do. Uh, James Cook. Thank you. Um, First Minister, none of the comparator countries you refer to in this document have been embedded in a 300-year-old trading and political union mm. with their closest neighbour. If leaving the EU has been as disastrous for Scotland and its economy as you describe, why wouldn't leaving this far more deeply embedded union be much worse, particularly in the first years or decades of an independent Scotland? I think I would add to that in, in two ways, James. Uh, firstly, uh, it wasn't inherent in the Brexit process that it ended up the deep mess that it has become. Uh, there was no planning, there was no prospectus, there was no basic honesty in the platform that was put forward uh, for the Brexit referendum. We had the, uh, the slogan, the lie, I think, as most people now recognise it, to be on the side of the bus. I mean, I, I'm publishing today the first in what will be a series of documents already in just one scene setting document today making the case for independence there is more thought there is more evidence there is more uh, clear planning uh, for the way ahead than there was in the entirety of the brexit campaign so constitutional change the world has many examples of constitutional change i mean it's often said you know in I think the years around the Second World War, there were 50 independent countries in the world. It's 200 or thereabouts today. Constitutional change is not something that is unknown in the world. What uh, matters is the way in which that is planned and the, uh, the integrity um, and the honesty of the platform in which it is built. And in that sense, uh, there could not be more difference between the case for independence and the case for Brexit. The second point I would make, though, is um, I, I don't accept, uh, and I know you're putting a, a journalistic question to me, so this is not uh, having in any way a go at the question, but you know, I, my opponents will put very pejoratively at that point in the way that, that you have put it. Um, I don't believe that that will be the experience of a planned uh, and properly uh, executed uh, road to independence. But you know, for any country, and this is really the choice that I think crystallises for Scotland right now, if we conclude, and I think it's hard to conclude otherwise right now, uh, that being part of the Westminster system is not serving Scotland's interests, either in terms of economic growth and productivity or in terms of social equity, fairness, uh, tackling poverty, if we conclude that it's not serving our uh, purposes and it's not serving our interests now and if we look ahead to the UK outside of the European Union and conclude that it is unlikely to start to do so in these circumstances then the choice is do we just accept that do we just accept that we're going to be consigned to a future of compared to all of our neighbours poor economic and social outcomes not fulfilling our potential being in a second best to put it politely situation or do we say change is never easy change is never without challenge but actually if all of these countries can be as successful relative to the uk as they are then with hard work with commitment with good planning why not scotland and that's the choice that people in scotland have to make it will be the people of scotland who make that choice but just as i will have an obligation to put the case for independence with my colleagues and with the wider independence movement there's a real responsibility on the part of those who argue for the status quo to set out why they think that that any longer serves the interests of Scotland. Uh, I'm going to go to Alan uh, Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Um, you, you spoke about forging a way ahead without a Section 30 <coughs> order if necessary and that a referendum uh, would be lawful. On, on what basis uh, can you say that? I mean, what advice have you received to say <coughs> um, about moving ahead without a Section 30 order? And can you detail? perhaps what some of those <coughs> options and ways forward would be. I'm not going to do that today, Alan, and I'm not going to do that because the work is underway. You also know the constraints I'm under when it comes to talking about uh, legal advice in particular, and um, I'm sure you weren't inviting me to breach the ministerial code, but in case you were, I'm going to resist, uh, resist that invitation. I, uh, and I'll say this uh, very, very clearly, I understand, I'm sure there will be questions as we go through this press conference about the process. Um, I understand how important those questions are, and I understand how important it is to answer those questions, but I also understand and take very seriously the responsibility to do that 
properly. Uh, the situation we're in right now is not one of my choosing. Um, I think it would be better for everybody on both sides of the independence debate to have a Scottish government and a UK government, as was the case in 2014, that respected the democratic process um, and recognised that we differ on the substance, but we have an obligation to enable the people to make the choice. That's not the position we are in. We, as I've said previously already this morning, we are dealing with a Prime Minister that doesn't respect democracy, the law, or any of the, the norms that underpin uh, democracies in, well, used to underpin democracies in the UK and, and still do in most uh, other countries. So I have to deal with that reality. Um, is that, uh, does that pose challenges? Does that, uh, and, and I've set those out, the ability of the Scottish Parliament to legislate uh, without a Section 30 order is contested. I believe we can navigate a path forward, but I'm going to do that responsibly and I'm going to do that properly and then I'm going to set that out to Parliament um, in the way uh, that people would expect me to. Um, I'm going to go now to Peter McMahon. Uh, thank you, First Minister. First Minister, you're confident you can have uh, a legal referendum. You're very confident that you can win that referendum and you want Scotland to become a member again of the European Union. That inevitably, inevitably will mean, won't it, that there will be a hard border across this island in the south of Scotland, between the south of Scotland and the north of England. There just has to be, because that will be the EU border, and won't have very significant and potentially damaging implications for the south of Scotland. I indicated in my opening remarks that uh, one of the papers we will publish in this series will be on uh, European Union membership. We will also, maybe the same paper, maybe two separate ones, on trade. Um, and as part of that, of course, we will confront uh, the implications of Brexit, which of course is not something the Scottish Government has chosen, but does, you're right to say, um, present uh, different challenges around uh, these issues. And of course, within I shouldn't say we here because it is the UK government is in a, a deep mess over the Northern Ireland Protocol with lots of very damaging implications because it has never levelled uh, with people in Northern Ireland or indeed the rest of the UK about the implications. Now, I think it's important to say, uh, and I'm sure I've said this to you before, that we're not dealing here with issues about the, the movement of people, the common travel area. I don't think there is anybody, certainly nobody with any credibility who would argue that Scotland would not uh, remain within the common travel uh, area. Uh, but the issues in terms of regulatory and customs issues around goods, we've, we've got to work out how that uh, operates in a way that would fulfil the requirements that would be on us in terms of European Union membership. And remember, the big advantages and benefits of European Union single market membership, a, a marketplace seven, eight times the size of the UK, uh, enormous potential to grow our trade and to grow our exports. Um, we need to uh, set out how we would deal with that in a way that isn't damaging to the south of Scotland uh, and isn't damaging to businesses. Um, I believe, again, and I, I, I will no doubt make this point on many occasions, not just today, but throughout this debate, uh, much of the mess the UK government is in is because of a lack of being honest with people and a lack of doing any planning for this. And because they're not prepared to be honest about the challenges that they need to overcome, in a sense, they're not able to do that planning because that then says uh, what the, the problems are. That's the mistake we've got to ensure that we don't replicate. So I'm not going to shy away from any of these issues. I think the benefits of Scotland being independent far outweigh any of these challenges, but how we overcome the challenges is important and we have a duty to set that out clearly and the future work in this series uh, will do that. Keenan Jenkins. You, you say you want to be honest about these challenges, you want to be frank with people, you want to be in the EU. Do you therefore agree with just about every reputable expert who say that there will be checks on goods going from England and Wales to Scotland and there will be a trade border between England and Scotland? Will there be a border, First Minister? <clears throat> I would... Uh encourage you um, to listen back to the answer I've just given to Peter. Uh, I am not going to uh, repeat the mistakes of Boris Johnson and pretend that implications of the decisions we take don't exist. If we are in the single market and the rest of the UK is outside the single market, then yes, there are issues in terms of uh, regulatory and customs uh, requirements that need to be met. 
what I'm saying is not that these challenges don't exist, but these challenges can be managed in a way that doesn't uh, present disadvantages to our businesses. Uh, and of course, what the benefits of that situation are is the ability to trade freely within a market that is seven, eight times bigger than the UK. Uh, so but in the, the, in the spirit of that honesty, you, you would presumably say that Brexiteers try to wish away this problem. Will you be frank with the Scottish I people and say frank. there will be a trade I'm, border? I think I've said very clearly there will be customs and regulatory issues on trade if we are in the single market. I think the benefits of being in the single market outweigh uh, the challenges there. But what I'm saying to you very frankly is we need to set out how those challenges will be met. Now, you know, in a sense, we, and this is, as I said earlier on, this is the absurdity or one of the many absurdities of the UK government position in the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, right now, the Northern Ireland Protocol which is allowing Northern Ireland effectively to trade within the single market uh, while uh, continuing to trade uh, across the rest of the UK has enormous benefits because it has, uh, and we can see that, the Northern Irish economy is doing better than any other part of the UK. So there are and actually some of the, uh, the, the suggested revisions and amendments put forward by the EU to uh, the protocol actually make sense in terms of easing that. So this is not about shying away from these issues. It's about saying these issues are not insurmountable if you come about them in the right you way. You have and shied away from the word border and the word checks. I, I, I've, I've perhaps shied away of giving you a, a, an easy headline, but people who are listening... Well, people well, who the are, reality of the situation they couldn't just about every recollection. I, I think everybody listening will hear what I'm saying. And what I think is important is that people do... and. Actually, this is what happened in 2014, which n maybe not everybody, but most people in here who covered the referendum will recall. People were able to understand the complexities, the nuances to get beyond uh, the headlines and to understand the real implications of what we're doing. And that is, what, uh, that is the spirit in which we will continue to take forward this debate. Patrick, do you want to add? I, I do think we also need to recognise the democratic imperative in this debate. Let's remember that Scotland was told in the run-up to the 2014 referendum, that the way to protect our place in the European Union was to vote no. Now, that hasn't happened. That promise has been broken. And it would be unreasonable, wildly unreasonable, I think, for that situation itself to be used as the argument for saying, for saying that Scotland and the people of Scotland are no longer able to make this choice and that the government of Scotland is no longer able to put that choice to them. Uh, do we have Sky? Yeah, Sky, Sky, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm Catherine Ivatotsi, standing Hi, here for sorry. James Matthews. Um, you've spoken a great deal about the future today, but currently domestic issues over which the Scottish Government does have a great deal of autonomy, health care, education, transport, are in crisis and have declined. We've seen a decline in the outcomes of those since uh, you have been in power. Is there any way you can give confidence to voters? And why should voters believe that there would be any better outcomes over the additional responsibilities afforded by a successful independence vote? Um, I, I, I don't expect, uh, accept some of the premise and the characterisation of that question, but I will uh, sort of deal with the substance of it. So it is not the case. I mean, you take the health service, for example, uh, right now, as with the situation in most countries, the impact of a two-year global pandemic has uh, had a, an adverse effect on waiting times in the National Health Service. That is not something that is in any way unique to Scotland. Uh, on education, there has been a COVID impact, but we are seeing improvements in attainment in education. Just a couple of weeks ago, we saw uh, the Scottish Government, uh, in the opinion of our independent fair access commissioner, uh, meet its targets on uh, the access to university of young people from our more deprived communities. The, uh, Commissioner described that as an unambiguous success. So we are seeing real progress, coupled with real challenge across a range uh, of the responsibilities we have uh, under our control right now. It is absolutely legitimate for people to look at that and decide, uh, do they trust overall uh, the Scottish Government and democratically elected Scottish Governments of whatever party uh, to make decisions for Scotland uh, more than they do UK governments, and that is part of the decision people in Scotland will arrive at. Um, and you know, the last thing I would say, and I appreciate I'm standing with the, the co-leader of another political party right now, but you know, sc scrutiny um, is not something that has been in short supply in Scotland. I've uh, been first minister here for less than eight years. I've fought eight elections in that time, and uh, my party has won all of them. So you know, people understand uh, the challenges we deal with, but the trust in uh, the 
party uh, that leads the Scottish Government, I think, has been demonstrated. Uh, Patrick, I should probably give you the opportunity on that note to say I mean, something. I, I think, obviously, there are people out there who, maybe in 2014, saw the case for independence but weren't convinced yet. There are people in the middle ground who can, you know, might not have decided yet how they'll vote in the next referendum. So we do want to, to make the case to them. And I think people in that situation should look, in particular, at some of the policy areas that sit partly between devolved powers and reserve powers, partly between the Scottish Government uh, and the UK, on uh, material equality within a society, the drive against child poverty. Just contrast the actions that are being taken by a Scottish Government that's doubled, created the Scottish Child Payment in the first place, then doubled it and committed to continuing to increase it against a UK Government uh, that's taken £20 out of universal credit. Uh, Contrast some of the energy issues. You know, uh, I think more people than ever before are clear that the responses we need on the climate emergency, on the cost of living crisis, and on energy security are the same agenda. They're the same actions. But this government in Scotland is putting record investment into energy efficiency to cut people's fuel bills. The UK government's alleged energy security strategy has nothing at all to say on that, and it's still not taking the regulatory decisions on energy that it needs to, to save people money, powers that we wish we had the ability to exercise here. So compare and contrast, look at the status quo, and I think if you, if you do that with a fair and impartial mind, you'll see that on so many of these issues, the status quo isn't working. Uh, Pierre, do you want to ask a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Um, during your speech, you said that uh, improvements after independence weren't guaranteed. How do you plan on persuading people that, despite that fact, they should still vote yes? And do you think that Scots should, should accept uh, an element of risk if they vote yes in another in referendum? Um, I think the risk of not being independent, as we have seen uh, to our great cost over the last few years, is much, much greater uh, than any risk that comes from being independent. I mean, that, that statement should not be controversial. The, the very fact of just being independent for, for any country in the world doesn't uh, magically guarantee success. What it does do is put the levers um, that determine success into your own hands. And like you know, all of us, I think, would accept in our personal lives, we prefer to be in charge of the decisions that uh, determine the paths we take and how successful we are than allow these decisions to be taken by somebody else. And I think people understand that. It's not possible uh, to see into the future you know, 5, 10, 20 years from now for any country. Any country will face challenges um, and setbacks. The question is, what is the best system of governance to equip you to deal with those? And I think if you went to any other country across the world right now that's already independent and suggested to them that somehow they'd be better not being independent when it comes to dealing with these challenges, they'd look at you um, a bit askance. So I, I think people uh, understand that point. I think they understood that in 2014. And I, I think with all of the experience uh, since 2014, they'll understand it even more uh, now. I mean, if you were to go back to 2014, um, if we were able to turn the clock back and tell people uh, the things that would have happened because we voted no then, we'd be taken out of the EU, uh, we'd have Boris Johnson as Prime Minister with everything that's come uh, from that, we'd have the you know, economic situation we've got right now exacerbated by Brexit. Does anybody really believe that that result wouldn't have flipped the other way in 2014? I think it is almost inarguable that people, if they had known what they uh, no now would have voted for independence then because we understand uh, that it is much better to chart your own destiny than have somebody else do it for you and we've learned that uh, pretty brutally in some respects uh, in the years since 2014. Uh, Gina, do you want to ask a question? Yes, thanks. Can I just <coughs> Navigate your way through that uh, iceberg dead ahead, which is Boris Johnson. Uh, 
Um, I, I would call Boris Johnson many things, none of them as polite as iceberg yet, I should say, but um, I'll, I'll leave that to, to one side. Icebergs melt, uh, so anyway. I'm they probably, have hidden depths as well. Uh, which Boris Johnson certainly doesn't, so I, I should probably stop uh, this line, <laughs> this train of thought before it gets me into trouble. Um, who am I pitching this at? Everybody out there. Um, Scotland will only become independent when a majority vote for it, and therefore, you know, whether people voted... Uh, yes in 2014, voted no in 2014, or as Patrick rightly said, whether uh, you're one of the adults out there who didn't have a vote in 2014 because you were too young, uh, this is pitched at you. It's making the case that independence doesn't guarantee success, but what is it about all these other countries that are on all of these indicators? And the ones I mentioned in my remarks are only some of the indicators that are set out in here. What is it that makes them so much more successful uh, and ask people to consider that as the, uh, the, the scene setter to the debate that will follow. Um, and lots of things are different because we've, you know, we're uh, many years on from 2014. Uh, the world has changed, so the data in here is uh, much more, uh, it's up to date, so obviously it didn't exist in this format in 2014. And we've seen the changes in the UK that is contributing to this relatively poor performance. Um, so. Uh, I think there is uh, plenty in here for people uh, to think about and uh, to give people uh, food for thought. Um, in terms of your question about fairness, to what, what would be unfair uh, to independent supporters, in fact unfair to the country, um, would be for me to stand here and pretend that there's not challenges to navigate through. I want to have... Uh, the, and I intend uh, to give people the choice that that mandate uh, was given to, uh, not to me as an individual, but to the Scottish Parliament for uh, last year. I intend to honour that. That is what democracy demands. Uh, but there are legal challenges to work through uh, if we are to uh, have what I think is essential to deliver independence, a lawful process. Um, and I would be uh, less fair to uh, people if I uh, didn't say that I'm taking all of that seriously and behaving responsibly um, and that I will set out that path uh, very soon. Uh, your question, I think, before the uh, summer recess, um, I said very soon. Um, I'm not sure I would describe September as very soon, so you can draw your own conclusions from that. Um, right, I, this is where my eyesight becomes a bit more uh, of a challenge. Uh, I'll take Kieran uh, and then Sev, uh, and then I'll come to finish time, isn't it? Finish time, sorry. Well, okay, sorry, I'll go to Kieran first. Thank you very much. Both of you talked about character and behaviour in office. Um, First Minister, one of your MPs, Patrick Grady, was today found guilty of sexual misconduct when he was Chief Whip of the SNP at Westminster. Is that the sort of behaviour you expect from an elected representative making the case for independence? And why is he still an SNP MP? Uh, thanks for the question, Kieran. I was uh, aware uh, that the outcome of that investigation was likely to be published this morning. As you will appreciate, I think it has been published while I've been standing here. I've not yet had the opportunity to uh, read the report, uh, the findings or, or any other aspect uh, of it. Uh, I will clearly uh, do that and I will uh, issue a response when I've had the opportunity to do it. But it would not be either fair or helpful for me to do it without having uh, seen the outcome. What I would say is, and I've said this before, uh, the highest standards, if we expect the highest standards from others, uh, then we have a duty to ensure that the highest, high, highest standards uh, are abided by within our own ranks as well. Was it appropriate for him to have kept the whip all this time? Uh, look, I haven't seen the reports. I've not seen the, the conclusions of the Commissioner. Uh, I've not seen uh, what exactly uh, has been upheld and, and what the circumstances of that is. Uh, indeed, and I'm not questioning that if that is what you're telling me, but I've not seen uh, the, the report. Uh, but I need to obviously read the whole thing before I, I comment in, in substance. I think that is uh, not an unreasonable position to take for something that has been published literally while I've been standing here at this podium. Would I go to that, Seth? Yeah. Uh, First Minister, thank you. You've already mentioned the significant economic damage and impact of Brexit, the COVID crisis. We're now seeing surging inflation. We're looking forward now to a flatlining economy, almost certainly a recession this winter and possibly a resurgence of COVID. Your own growth commission suggested it could take 10 years before Scotland would start finding itself at a level where its economy was reaching the sorts of performance levels that these countries you've identified have. So how many years of pain do you think Scots would have to endure? Economic pain, tax rises, service cuts, and government spending cuts before Scotland reaches any of the GDP rates that you have flagged in this report? 
Well, firstly, we are facing years of pain with low growth, high inflation, uh, with the misery that that is heaping on individuals right now if we don't become independent. That is guaranteed, and I don't think that is too strong a word to use. The question then is, do we just accept that, or do we look at comparator countries that have all been dealing with the same challenges in terms of COVID um, and the wider issues around cost of living that the UK is, but are performing much better? And do we decide that the sooner we get onto that path, uh, then the earlier we will work our way towards the kind of success that they enjoy? And that question then is determined by the decisions we take. Uh, the starting point of independence, of course, will be subject to negotiations. And then the decisions we take to ensure that we start to emulate comparable countries uh, rather than continue to be consigned uh, to low growth and high, er, higher cost of living um, and lower uh, living standards as a result of remaining within the Westminster system. Well, the time frame will, the starting point is when Scotland uh, votes independence and then we will have a process of negotiation. But this, this question to me um, is just as legitimately turned on its head. We know right now that if we don't become independent, all of the things that you have set out are guaranteed. We are seeing a UK that will uh, next year have the lowest growth of the G20 with the exception of Russia. We see higher costs of living than uh, any other, uh, almost any other developed economy. Uh, we are seeing uh, Brexit deliver significant damage to our trading opportunities. That is baked in if we stay as we are. Now, does deciding to change uh, in any walk of life and in any circumstance present challenges? Uh, yes, but it is better to get yourself onto a path that you can ensure through the decisions you take, as opposed to the decisions that are imposed on you, leads to a better outcome uh, than simply accepting uh, what we know will be the case if we don't change. I, th I think both of our opening remarks acknowledged and, and you know, gave some real in indication of the, the challenges the whole world is facing right now, in the here and now and in the longer term. But for me, acknowledging the challenges that the world is facing is not a reason to keep our hands tied. Quite the reverse. It's a reason to untie our hands and take the responsibility as well as the opportunity to face those challenges head on. I'll go to the FT uh, next, and then if I can see some hands up, I've got lots. Okay. Afternoon, First Minister. Luka Nyamnyanda from the Financial Times. Uh, I was just looking at the polls, but despite everything we know since 2014 and everything you've outlined, people's unhappiness about Brexit and Tory governments, but su support for independence is not much any higher than it was in 2014. Why do you think that is the case? Like, uh, what, what is not, why is it not resonating with people? And Secondly, how worried are you if you were, say, you got a compromise with Boris Johnson and you did get the vote in 2023, how worried would you would the, would the long term impact be if you lost it in terms of <laughs> <laughs> would, would, would it write it off forever, possi possibly? We probably uh, shouldn't lose it then. I think that is basically the moral of that question. We <laughs> don't uh, lose it and, and don't intend to. Um, I go back to what I said earlier. Look, you know, when, when you put a choice before people, then it is a choice for people. Um, and, you know, you will always have the uncertainties that come with that. I'm as certain as it is possible to be that the next time of asking, people in Scotland will not uh, miss the opportunity to vote for independence because, you know, apart for many reasons, but not least the fact that we uh, remember uh, what happened in the wake of 2014 because we didn't become independent and many of the mm -hmm. challenges that we're dealing with right now actually uh, can uh, take their uh, or have their roots in, in that decision. Uh, on your first question about polls, again, perfectly legitimate to look at polls. I think almost every poll since 2014 has uh, shown support for independence higher than it was in September 2014. Um, there have been a number of polls that show majority support for independence, uh, a number that show uh, that that is not the case. And I would characterise uh, the polls overall as being broadly 50-50. Now, I've been in politics a long time. You know, if you go back to my earlier days in politics and told me that 50-50 for independence, it was anything other than a very, very good uh, starting point, I would uh, have looked at you a bit uh, oddly. So polls will come and go um, outside the, the heat of battle, to use uh, that phrase. I think once the, the campaign is engaged, and today is the starting point of that, uh, as people's minds uh, start to focus, then I think we will see 
support for independence rise, but the only, uh, I'll, I'll use here the ultimate in politician cliche, the only poll that matters is the one on polling day. Uh, right, I'm going to try and uh, quickly, Rachel, uh, and then I'll come over to this group here. Thank you, First Minister. Um, you say you want a referendum by the end of next year, but realistically, is the next staging point for a vote not the next general election when you have the possibility of a hung parliament and possibly doing a deal with Labour, for example, if there is a hung parliament? And also, we have these huge NHS waiting lists, um, ferries running hugely over budget and late, limited progress on closing the attainment gap. Is this not just a huge distraction from the issues facing Scotland at the moment? Um, on your first question, I'm going to uh, do what I think is important in uh, work to the mandate that my government, the Scottish Parliament, won, which is to offer uh, people the choice in this Parliament in the time frame we set out in, in a referendum, and that's what I'm focused on, on seeking to do. Uh, no, it's not a distraction. Those who want to say it is a distraction will always take something to, to argue that case, and usually uh, in terms of politicians and uh, opponents of independence, uh, they say it as a distraction because they don't want to engage on, on the substance of the case, because the substance of the case uh, against independence becomes, I think, more and more threadbare by the day. Uh, what we are setting out here is an alternative, an alternative to the certainty of uh, all of the things I've just been talking about in response to, to SEV, if we don't become independent. Now, these are the choices uh, people make. Uh, the government's day-to-day -day priorities uh, continue. These are priorities I uh, take seriously each and every single day. But giving Scotland the alternative to continued uh, decline, uh, a declining UK, I think is really important. And I think this is the right time um, and the vital time to do it. Um, right. So, a choice I have. Chris. Um, oh, okay, thank you. Um, First Minister, are you concerned that if for any reason there is a delay in delivering an NDRF2 next year, the independent supporters are simply going to run out of patience? Uh, no, but that's mainly predicated on the fact that I intend that there will be. Um, so that's what I'm focused on, on achieving. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeah, so just, um, you'd said on the kind of different issues that the, the paper's coming up will look at. So I just kind of I'd had a quick look at what you'd said, um, but there was no mention of energy. I guess it's kind of for both of you. So I want to know if, you know, the campaign that's coming up, will there be a move away from oil compared to 2014, where that was a really big part of the campaign? And I also noticed that there was a mention of the gender pay gap in this paper from the very kind of quick um, read of it I've had. So will there be in the future papers, papers as well things towards, you know, women and minorities and things yeah. about how that can... Benefit so, yeah, I mean, I, I should say, uh, I think, uh, apologies if I didn't use the word include when I, uh, I listed that. It wasn't meant to be exhaustive. There will be other papers over and above. The ones I've mentioned today, the issues that you've talked about certainly will be covered in the, the canvas energy. I mean, we're in a transition away from fossil fuels already. The imperative is to to, to that as quickly and as, as justly as possible. And you know how important uh, I consider issues of uh, gender equality are. So these will be issues that we cover. What I chose to mention today are, I think, the key ones that people always you know, say, are you going to cover this when we're talking about the independence debate? Yeah, so, yeah, and just to reinforce that it's not only the government and not only our political parties that are part of this, uh, this debate. We want everybody in Scotland to contribute ideas uh, as well and to be part of, of shaping Scotland's future. Uh, it would be, I think it would be appalling if this debate uh, was monopolised only by the views of, of those in government today. Uh, this has to be a live and inspiring and engaging debate uh, that brings in all of those visions uh, and, and, uh, and challenges as well from right across Scotland. Uh, and I think there are a great many organisations in civic society as well as at community group level that will, uh, that will bring real creativity to bear. And uh, now to, to tell me how he's been persuaded of the case for independence I've made today, I'll go to Simon Johnson at The Telegraph. Thank you, First Minister. Um, it is quite difficult to see Boris Johnson changing his mind on this, given everything else that's going on in the world. Um, and the Supreme Court judgment last October didn't really give you any encouragement that your own referendum bill would would be given uh, would be um, ruled legal, given given that two bills there were described as being ultra vires. Um, is it? Are, are you just disappearing down a constitutional sort of rabbit hole here, a cul-de-sac? Because it's very difficult to see out with those two options, how you could possibly hold a legal referendum. And linked to that, um, you, you've, you've recognised that uh, any referendum result would have to be uh, recognised internationally. 
But the first stage of that is it would have to be recognised by the UK government. So it's very difficult to sort of set up a process that they don't agree with and then get them to agree the result. Um, to Patrick, um, I remember the, the papers that were produced by the Scottish Government before the last referendum, and they were setting out the Scottish Government's position on things like the Queen being head of state, uh, being in NATO. Will these papers set out your position as well as uh, the SNP's position on, on issues such as this? Thank you. Um, I'll pass to Patrick in a, a second. Um, I, I should say, first of all, Boris Johnson is not refusing to give a Section 30 order because of other things that are happening in the world. He's refusing because he is somebody who has no respect whatsoever for democracy. Let's not... Um, you know, sort of uh, mess about and, and beat about the bush on, on these things. Um, Simon, part of the job of being First Minister is to navigate your way through the difficult things, not just the, the easy things. So yes, we have uh, the challenges that I have set out today that you have uh, rather uh, more uh, sort of bluntly uh, set out here today. That's my job. It's to find uh, a path through to deliver the mandate I have, and that's what uh, I am uh, doing just now and what I will set out to Parliament soon. Uh, Tom? Oh, sorry, yeah, Patrick, I mean, sorry, sorry. Obviously, the, the papers that the Scottish Government produces will touch on issues where we already agree on what the, the first steps for an independent Scotland will be, and it may touch on uh, issues where we, we need to acknowledge that there's a range of views out there, not just uh, between and within our own political parties, but in, in wider society as well. The fundamental point, though, that brings this together is that these are questions the people of Scotland should be able to decide for themselves democratically, and right now they can't. Can I just check, well, you need the UK to accept the result, though, don't you? I mean, well, uh, Simon, I will leave it to you if you want to go even further than I have in demonstrating that the UK government is not uh, in any way respectful of democracy. Um, but if you're really premising a question on the basis that not only will they not uh, agree the transfer uh, around Section 30, but they wouldn't agree a democratic vote no, of the people of Scotland, then, now, well, look, the look, I will set out the way forward uh, in the Sort of way that I've, I've set out today and um, I will I'll perhaps leave the Telegraph to be one of the, the last remaining uh, defenders of the indefensible when it comes to Boris Johnson. Uh, Tom. Thank you, uh, First Minister. Um, yesterday, Glenn Campbell asked you if the referendum would take place <coughs> next year and you said yes, but you said several times today that the law on the issue is uncertain in the absence of a Section 30 order. How can you be categorical about the timing when you cannot be categorical about the law? Uh, look, my intention is that it will be before the end of next year. I think there is uh, the ability to do that, um, and I will set out uh, the path that I think achieves that very soon. Uh, just uh, just find a quick follow-up on that. Are you therefore saying that uh, a referendum next year is contingent on a positive decision from the United Kingdom Supreme Court? Other, I'm not saying anything other than I have already said, and I'll say but more. It's your intention if, rather than a guarantee. I have, I have said what I've said. You can look what I said to Glenn. You can see what I've said today. You can see what I've said in my remarks, and I will say more shortly. Alistair. Uh, hi there. Thanks very much. Um, would you like to see a, a kind of formal broad church yes campaign as in 2014? And I think you were asked this yesterday, but I wasn't sure if there was a clear answer on it. Would you share a platform with Alex Salmond? Uh, that latter one probably qualifies as one of the least important questions of the entire independence debate. It's not about me, it's not about Alex Salmond with the greatest respect, it's not even about Patrick Harvey. It's about the future of Scotland and I'm going to continue to focus on the, the issues that matter to people across Scotland and to, uh, as First Minister, as uh, leader of the SNP, to uh, lead that debate. Um, and in terms of a broad church, the, the campaign for independence is broad church and will be broad church and actually that is one of its great strengths because independence fundamentally is about democracy and in any democracy you have a difference of opinion and people decide in elections uh, which path they want the country to take so that's a strength uh, not in any way a weakness um, Andy. Hi, um, oil and gas and energy has been touched on a little bit there. Um, I can't help but notice, but a lot of the comparator countries, but Norway features very highly, and you, you know, we've already acknowledged that there's going to be a long run-up to, to meeting these comparator countries. Is it not tempting then to try and squeeze a little bit more out of the oil and gas before you rush into um, fulfilling the sort of net zero ambitions? I mean, you, you've disagreed on this in the past. Do you disagree still about the best way to use the oil and gas industry as a way of funding, as it did in 2014, it was baked in, as a way of funding this new prospectus? Um, look, 
our position, joint position, is set out in the the Butte House Agreement, um, and we agree very strongly that the the climate crisis is is real and pressing and urgent, and not just in Scotland, but across the world, we have to accelerate the move away from fossil fuels. Happily for Scotland, and not every country can say this, there are massive economic advantages in that transition. We see that just in the Scotland auction, for example. So uh, we are in perhaps a, a more fortunate position than many countries are in making that transition, but it's got to be a fair one. Nobody is arguing that you, you switch off oil and gas uh, overnight or anything like that, but making that transition and planning for that transition in a fair and just way, um, I think, is an essential part of what Scotland has to do, whether or not we become independent, although we uh, take uh, more powers with independence over some of these issues than we have right now. Yeah, I mean, I think very clearly the position of the Scottish Government uh, has changed uh, significantly from 2014. I think some of that had already begun to happen before the, the Butte House Agreement, uh, which brought the Greens into government. Some of it has happened subsequently. But the, the reality uh, of how fast a transition we need to make, uh, I think, is now well understood. You know, if, if the world had begun the kind of transition that needs to happen 20 or 30 years ago, it could have been done slowly and easily. The only reason that we're in a climate emergency uh, is that that early action uh, didn't happen all of those decades ago when the, uh, the scientific community around the world was first bringing the alarm bells. But we can make that change uh, in a fair as well as a fast way. And I think the, the fact that the comparator countries in this document include fossil fuel, fuel producers, as well as countries that are not fossil fuel producers and are more dependent on uh, an existing energy system. They include uh, you know, countries that have different types of economic model from you know, broadly social democratic, uh, left of centre societies, as well as others that, that have an economic model that I personally wouldn't support and would criticise. This is a broad range of comparator countries. Not only, uh, there's not one you know, kind of parallel Scotland in, in this report. There's a broad range of countries with different economic challenges, opportunities, contexts, uh, and uh, economic policies. Uh, and I think the fact that the, the comparison is so clear across the broad range of those countries really reinforces the point that we're making. It is a fact that we're going to be seeing rising oil and gas revenues because energy prices are as they are, you know, now and in the future. Um, the question should be, uh, and this would be a question if these were coming to an independent Scotland, is how we use them to uh, support and accelerate the climate transition and uh, ensure benefits for future generations. Right, we are running very short of time now. I've gone over uh, the time allotted, but uh, I'm looking to see if there are... Uh, yeah, OK, can I... Right, very quick questions. Uh, I'll take this one here and Tom. <coughs> Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask if you can outline for us the timeline of the um, publication of the subsequent papers that you have. I also wanted to ask about voter fatigue. As you've pointed out, Scots are never finished voting. So how are you going to try and ensure that high level of engagement within this to be... Politician fatigue might be more of a, a real issue than voter fatigue. Um, look, I think 2014 tells us when this issue comes to be... Uh, decided on, you will have massive, uh, I think, interest, enthusiasm and, and voter turnout. Um, I'm not, we, literally, I'll be candid with you, we haven't uh, determined or decided yet the uh, precise order and sequencing and, and dates for the, the subsequent papers, uh, but they will, you know, come over the, uh, the months and uh, fairly steadily um, over uh, the latter part of this year. And lastly, Tom. Thank you, First Minister. Um, you've described today as a starting point for the independence campaign. Um, the questioning today will give an indication that the whopping great elephant in the room is the legality of a future referendum. Um, can I explain, or can you explain, sorry, why you've decided to open this push for independence with this comparison document rather than setting out why you think, how and, how and why you think it's legal? Look, I think I've said uh, today on, in my opening remarks and in response to several questions what I intend to do there and I've, I've been very clear about the, the way in which I, I intend to, to set uh, these things out. But Scotland's going to have its choice on independence, you know, not even Boris Johnson, uh, probably especially not Boris Johnson actually, can stand ultimately in the way of democracy. So Scotland's going to get its opportunity uh, to cast its, its verdict on independence. So uh, I think it is the right time um, and important to ensure that when that choice comes, it is an informed choice that we start to lay out as we're doing today the substantive case. Uh, thank you all very much indeed.
Uh, I think I've addressed that issue on many. I think I've addressed the issue of what I'm going to do before recess many times. Uh, well, I can assure you, I have. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everyone.